Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, Russian icons, fake Fermiers and damaged art in Lebanon. An exhibition celebrates 100 years of Russia's iconic art and architecture school. Everything in here was stolen and they put me in charge of finding out who took it and who sold it to the Nazis. Full of paintings and Nazis, a new movie is out. A British painter unveils his work of faded scenes from Beirut. What Bauhaus is for Germany, that's what Bukitimas is for Russia, albeit a little less known. But one exhibition wants to show that the Ruskies are just as influential as the Germans. Futamas 100, School of the Avant-Garde, celebrates the centenary of the art and technical school founded in 1920 in Moscow. Also dubbed as the Russian Bauhaus, the exhibition showcases works produced during its 10-year existence. The state-run Futamas was the result of the merging of several artistic schools just like its German counterpart. But unlike Bauhaus, there were no special requirements needed to study at the Russian school, which means it accepted more students. It is important that the attention at the exhibition is focused on students' artworks and not on works by teachers, which are often exhibited. Not all the students' works are masterpieces, but they are extremely interesting and important as a demonstration of the teaching method, as a result of students' education. Normally they sit in museum storages and aren't exhibited. That's why it was important for us to show them, probably for the first time. The exhibition also sheds new light on the Futamas teachers, more like its groundbreaking innovators, including Alexander Rochinka, Varvara Stepanova, Nikolai Ladovsky and others. This is a real revelation, because many teachers are known only as artists, but as teachers they are almost unknown, for example Vera Muhina. This is a completely new side of their life and of their creative personality as teachers. In particular, this exhibition is about that. After 10 years of their work, Futamas was dissolved in 1930, because just like Bauhaus, it flourished during a more liberal period and then faced pressure from increasingly totalitarian regimes. What was left of it merged into various other programs. I'm an architect, and I studied in Moscow Architectural Institute, which was linked to Futamas. That's why I'm interested to see what others did before me and how they try to express themselves. And today, the school's innovative achievements can be seen in many areas of art and design. Despite such a legacy, Futamas is still overshadowed by the famed Bauhaus. Maybe exhibitions such as this one will help it get the long overdue recognition it deserves. Let's talk to the scholar Jonathan Charlie, who joins me from Glasgow. Hi, lovely to have you on Showcase today. So let's start with this. We've been doing it as well, and a lot of people dub uh, Vukitimas as the Russian Bauhaus. How accurate do you think this is and how fair is it really uh, to Vukitimas? I think it's a somewhat inevitable uh, comparison. Uh, they coexisted in time. Uh, there was an immense intellectual traffic between uh, Moscow and Berlin uh, in particular. They shared, I think, a lot of pedagogical aims in the idea of having a common foundation course that was very, very broad, very wide ranging and encouraged students to experiment in all areas of creative activity to do with the arts and architecture before going on to specialise. So there is that. And of course, many of the artists and architects involved knew each other. So Nam Garbo taught in both Bukutimas and he taught in, uh, in, in the Bauhaus. Vasily Kandinsky, the great painter, he also taught in, um, 
in in Moscow as well before moving uh, to to Germany and so on. So there is that connection. Where perhaps it is a little bit unfair is that the Kutamas, in my opinion anyway, uh, was far broader ranging in terms of its activities. And it had a very, very peculiar political context that I think separates it out from what happened in Germany, because the Kutamas has to be seen in the context of the broader history of the Russian avant-garde, uh, whose history you cannot separate from the, the Russian Revolution of 1917. There is also, unfortunately, a very uh, uh, tragic connection between the two schools in that as critical laboratories of experimental and creative ideas, they did not endear themselves to authoritarian dictators and the Kutamas was closed during the Stalinist counter-revolution in 1930 and, of course, in 1933 mm -hmm. the Bauhaus was closed by the Nazis. Okay, Jonathan, this was a really good overview. Let's go uh, point by point together. So I wonder where you think Wukutimus stood in uh, the Soviet project of modernism. I mean, what political role did it fill in? Gracious me, I think um, it opened up a world of possibilities. It asked the questions about what a post-capitalist city might be like. It explored uh, the, the language of architecture and art, so there was a formal and technological element to it, but it also questioned what the social and political role of the artist and architecture should be in a post-revolutionary society. So in that sense, it, it tells a very unique and extraordinary story that I'm not too sure is matched anywhere else in the world. Um, I mean, just a look at some of the luminaries who actually taught there is probably enough to explain why it's still important to this very day and time. Nam Garbo, the painters Malievich, Popova, Kandinsky, the textile designer Vavara Stepanova, the graphic designer Lizitsky. So it represents an extraordinary archive, treasure trove, body of ideas mm -hmm. on what the possibilities of art and architecture could be. Okay, Jonathan, you mentioned the role of the artist in obviously uh, the Soviet context, but going back to Bauhaus, for example, uh, as far as I know, to my limited knowledge, I think in Bauhaus, uh, mainly the, the philosophy was to erase the difference, the essential difference between the artist and the craftsman, really. So it, they were all the artists, architects, sculptors, they were um, asked to return to the crafts. And that had a political meaning, of course. Was it the same in Vukatimas? It was very similar. So there was a common foundation course that mimics in some ways what went on in the Bauhaus. The students were encouraged to think and experiment in a formal sense, but also to understand the technological possibilities of what modern architecture and modern design could be. So there were famous metal working classes, woodworking classes. They weren't necessarily always entirely successful, but that isn't so much the point. And that was Brought part and parcel of a broader political project that saw the artist and saw the architect very much as a servant of the people, you know, the streets, uh, out into the streets, out of the galleries, into the streets. You know, the audience is no longer the bourgeoisie in the art gallery. Your audience, the consumers for art, are the people. And I think that certainly was a very, very powerful sentiment in the Kutumas that was reflected in many ways, of course, within the Bauhaus as well, although not mm -hmm. by all means by, by everyone concerned. Concerned. Lovely, thank you for that. And um, I wonder how much of an academic freedom did they have, given that it was opened by uh, after a decree from Lenin? It was, well, very interestingly, before what became, before the Stalinist counter-revolution, there was, and sometimes it's romanticised, but a 10-year period, generally of the Russian avant-garde, that maximised, I mean, Lunacharsky, uh, who was later known as the Commissar of the Enlightenment, uh, his ambition was to set up kind of like free uh, laboratories with maximum creative freedom. So there was no one style, there was no one ideological position 
position that students were required to adopt. Many of the students gravitated, for instance, to the constructivists who were perhaps more overtly political. But it's, uh, the emphasis, certainly in the early 1920s, was on diversity and a plurality of opinion, which is another reason why I think it is so, so important to study exactly how they went about that uh, in the context of higher education today. Mm -hmm. So yes, it was about maximum creative uh, freedom, uh, which I think is hugely significant. Okay, you mentioned uh, the plur plurality of opinion, but then I think this whole equal the school uh, dissolved for political reasons. Yes, very much so. Uh, I mean, I think you have to the, the the fate of the Kutamas was very much wound up with the whole fate of the revolutionary movement and broader cultural questions within the conditions of a centralized uh, uh, dictatorship. There is very little room for kind of artists, for writers, for, for painters and architects who thought uh, creatively and critically about their role in society. You know, dictators, authoritarian governments want to make the world in their own image. And so you cannot have avant-garde artists painting black squares and writers kind of like, Bul like Bulgakov uh, writing novels that feature satirical kind of like talking cats and the devil and so on and so on. So there was a broad-based attack on the avant-garde as part of the political counter-revolution, well, which was more or less complete by the early 1930s. And many of the avant-garde artists either fled into exile, some of them ended up in the gulag and died during the 1930s. So there's a real, real sad and tragic story uh, that unfortunately kind of uh, uh, we should remember, uh, I think, because it has huge implications, I think, for our current predicament today in the role of the artists and architects in contemporary societies, in particular in regimes and political cultures that are hostile to creative and critical thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a very sad story, but very powerful and inspiring as well. Jonathan Charlie, it was lovely having you. Thanks a lot for this enlightening Thank you interview. very much. Thank you. New movies continue to be released despite the coronavirus. And if you're in the mood for a period piece that combines art and courtroom drama, The Lost Vermeer is out in theatres. Everything in here was stolen and they put me in charge of finding out who took it and who sold it to the Nazis. The Last Vermeer tells the story of Han van Meegeren, a Dutch painter and art dealer. The artist was famous for two things throwing parties and selling art. He even sold a rare Vermeer piece to Hitler's second-in-command. Turns out he forged the paintings and defrauded Nazi officials during World War II. But as history tells us, it didn't take long for Van Meegeren to get caught. Guy Pearce has the lead role as the art forger. But the idea of somebody, you know, sort of seemingly, you know, forging an artist like Vermeer, when there was only 30-odd paintings in existence anyway, I mean, what the audacity of that is quite remarkable. That was also the reason why I was fascinated in the character, because he's just so audacious. He didn't start small, you know. <laughs> he didn't sort of go, I might just copy, you know, Hilda down the road and see if I can knock off one of her paintings and sell one of hers. No, I'll go for Vermeer. Why not? Snack the big fish. But Van Meegeren wasn't without talent. He was a prolific artist who painted thousands of pieces, and he even influenced the actor who plays him. And in fact, you know, I had said to the producers, I said, look, I actually love painting. I really do love painting, and I haven't done it for years. And they said, can we send you an easel? Can we send you some paints and some brushes and some canvases? I said, please do. So they did. I was in Holland, so they sent me a bunch of stuff. And I started just painting, just sort of getting my hand back in, as they say. Van Meegeren's originals never got much appreciation, but his fakes were good enough to make millions of dollars and inspire a skillful performance by a Hollywood star. After months of being shut down due to COVID-19, the Sydney Opera House is open once again. But this time, it's staging performances without selling a single seat. Take a look. 
It's been nearly eight months since the Sydney Opera House cancelled all of its public performances due to the pandemic. But although the theatre seats remain empty, the stage is busier than ever, hosting more than 50 events, all of them to an empty house. When the doors closed, we decided that uh, we wanted to continue the work of the house during the pandemic and continue to present work, and particularly new Australian work, which is very challenging to do uh, when uh, there's no audience present. So we essentially created a digital season and for the last seven months I've been presenting a mix of new works live on stage and archive material from uh, Sydney Opera House. Backs against the walls, we have hope still. The performances are part of the famous Opera House's digital series From Our House to Yours which includes live music, dance, opera, comedy and cabaret. Over a period of more than 30 weeks, the digital program received more than 6 million views and downloads from virtual audiences across the world. Buchanan says that this is the best way to connect with the audiences now and in the foreseeable future. One of the key things this has shown us is that the future of the Opera House can include a hybrid model of live presentation and digital presentation. I think prior to COVID there's perhaps some kind of reticence or a kind of lack of understanding that actually digital can enhance the experience or can certainly run in parallel and provide an alternative. Um, and now that we've done it at volume consistently week after week, we can now see that that hybrid model is actually one that's viable going forward. One of the live stream events the Opera House crew are setting up for is with the Australian psychedelic jazz band Gottet. They've played at the Opera House before, but never without a live audience. I'd like to think there's not that much of a difference. I'd like to think that we're going to give the same amount of energy or the music's going to be just as good. There's definitely an energy exchange that happens with a live audience. But, um, I guess, who knows, I've done some, I've done a whole bunch of live streams during this period actually in l less high production value. Did a bunch from home and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but I guess we'll, we'll soon find out. We're definitely excited. Gotet debuted a new performance called 60 Giant Steps. It's a 40-minute improvised performance inspired by John Coltrane's revolutionary jazz composition Giant Steps, which celebrates its 60th anniversary this year. While Rodriguez is able to tackle one of the hardest jazz compositions ever written, he finds the idea of performing via live stream a little hard to comprehend. I know I can't conceive the possibility of all 7 billion or how many people have access to internet being able to tune in and check this thing out. It's crazy. And he's not the only one who think that. Learning how to adapt and perform in front of an empty room has been a struggle for a lot of artists. Most artists are used to performing in front of a live audience. That, that's what they do. So this quite often is, is unusual for them or they don't have much experience. So, so we brief them on what the setup is, where the cameras are, how we mic it, how it's going to sound. And then they can use that to maximise their performance um, and amplify that uh, so that people out you know, anywhere in the world are watching it and they can engage with it and connect with it. Since the Opera House closed in March, they've been working hard in a tight schedule to build a virtual library of performances but the venue says they're confident in what they've achieved so far. We now have a large library of programming that uh, we didn't have seven months ago, and that will be available now for a long time so that audiences around the world can see the work uh, and also see what was created in these uh, extraordinary times. The Sydney Opera House is planning to do more streamed events moving forward, but is also planning on staging live shows at the venue with 50% reduced capacity. Next in line is a revival of the musical Rent, which opens in December. There is an ongoing saying roaming in Lebanon that Beirut now exists more in paintings than in real life. Through the paintings of a British artist, we discover some of these vanished scenes. Mm. 
Despite the challenging times that Lebanon has been going through, the British painter Tom Young is exhibiting his work in the symbolic setting of a Turkish hammam situated in the city of Saida. Well, the hammam in Saida is a very special place, Hammam Al Jadid, um, because for me it symbolizes a place where all different religious communities and people from all economic backgrounds can congregate and join together with a common purpose of cleansing and healing. And I think this is really relevant for us today because we're going through this, this great trauma um, in Lebanon and globally. Young has been living and painting the Lebanese capital for years. So, in a way, my connection to Lebanon is, is deep and emotional and I identify with the place. I may not be from here, um, I'm from Britain, but um, yeah, the place moves me and it inspires me as an artist more than anywhere that I've been in the world. And I've painted in many continents all over the world. So there was something about Lebanon that really inspired me and still inspires me. Fascinated by the traditional architecture at first, Young couldn't help but shift his focus onto the events that have swarmed the city starting with the 2019 revolution, also known as the Thawra. Well, I think after the explosion and actually um, during the Thawra as well, um, my painting became much more energetic. Um, I was using much thicker paint with a knife. Um, straight out of the tube and not slashing at the canvas um, as if I was channeling my own anger uh, or my own excitement or my own trauma into the painting directly. His paintings have chronicled what's been happening in the city as he feels a responsibility to capture Beirut's historic events. I think because I've, I've experienced these crises um, firsthand and um, it's affected me directly. I mean, the studio was smashed to pieces and the explosion and my home in Jamezi was also devastated um, and had I been here or been at home that day, then I may well have been badly injured or perhaps killed. I'm very fortunate to have been uninjured that day. But yeah, as an artist, I feel like I, 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 I want to tell the truth about what's happening. not plan on restoring his damaged works. He says those wounds put the pain in the word painting. I think the paintings now, because they're wounded, they contain more meaning. And instead of hiding that wound, um, I think it's important to actually integrate that wound into the art in the same way that we all have to integrate our trauma into our lives. We can't just sweep it under the carpet and pretend it never happened. Um, we have to somehow live with it and hopefully over the years um, let it heal. Indeed, many Lebanese need to cope with the trauma they have lived through. In a way, Art has become the outlet that both painters and viewers are healing through. Rola Broche, TRT World, Beirut.
That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter account have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilf Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.